everybody. Happy Monday. This is Anne and welcome back to Reaper Pro Tips where we sit and paint things randomly. And today we're very random because I'm using a wet palette. Yes, I've decided to torment myself and show you guys why it's such a torment. <laughs> no, no, no. Actually, I decided to try to speed paint something. And so uh, wet palette is, uh, I've decided to use large brush wet palette, which is uh, the whole reason to use wet palette, in my opinion, if you're using a very big brush um, and you want to paint fast, uh, wet palette is good for that. So we're going to do something weird today. I'm not even, the wet, the well palette has been banished. It is up on the shelf. So, so we'll talk about that. Uh, do, 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 do. Let me see. Hello, Anki and Francis and Kermiko and, uh, Griggy and Justin is not here. So, uh, he will, he will see, he, you'll have to say re-hi to him, Griggy, afterwards. Um, Justin is pretty much, uh, Monday morning is ReaperCon meetings at Reaper. So he was at Reaper, but he pushed the button and pretty much ran for home. Um, we may be in danger of having a dog emergency today because Kiri did not have a full <clears throat> operation this morning. So, uh, we'll see, right? So, uh, if Justin, uh, is not on and Kiri, uh, activates, then, uh, I'm going to have to have you guys start some entertaining discussion. <laughs> Or we'll have to magically summon Reaper John or, or Planner. Um, there's Planner. Woohoo. Uh, mm hmm. I don't hate Wet Palette, Kiriniko, but it's not my style, right? It's David's style. It's the style of many, many people. Um, but it is good for some stuff. Yes, exactly. Hello, and thank you for the resub, Planner. Nine month streak. Hey, Iggy. Hey, Steven. I don't think I've seen you before, Stephen. If you if you are a new person, then hello. If you are a, a renamed version of an earlier person, then re-hello. Re Re-hi, as we used to say. Oh, I like the Rainbow Coyote or whatever you just linked, Anki. I can't tell what that is, but it looks like it has ears. Yes, hello. Yeah, so yeah, we might have a cure emergency. We'll, uh, it's extremely, I would say as far as the like, you know, you never, it's like weather. You never get an exact forecast, but I'd say there is at least an 80% chance of Kiri emergency today. So we'll see. Rhino? Interesting. Hello, Twistedoma. Hello, hello. All right. Let us see. Let us just, uh, let's just jump in. Justin said I had to have the show not go short today, so you get at least an hour, an hour in a van and maybe an hour and a half of van. Let's rock to the camera. Here's my silly wet palette. And I'm also handicapping myself because I am, uh, I'm using parchment paper. It's actually, I really like the Masterson wet palette paper if I'm going to use wet palette. And most of the people I know who like wet palettes hate it. So I'm also an oddball in that. Um, but I just don't like the parchment, how little, I don't know. It's just a little bit different. I'm not a big fan. So here we go. We're going to actually use a wet palette and I'm laying out my little dabs of color. And actually I'm going to lay out a little bit more dabs of color because we are going fast today. We are painting Bed Mimic. Rawr. Bed Mimic is 44106. Um, when I got him, I had actually hoped that he would have like sheets or something that I could freehand on, but he is not that sort of Bed Mimic, it seems. Um, he is, uh, his, where his sheets would be, his mouth would be. So I'm kind of tempted to paint the outside edges of the mouth blue. <laughs> Like I originally wanted to do for blood bed sheets and then go to the inside of the mouth and go pink. Um, so we're laying stuff out. So strategy on a wet palette. Yeah, Adorama. I'm uh, making myself use a wet palette today. I decided it would be entertaining. It's a Monday. So what could go wrong? <laughs> so I'm using fresh blood. It's the only red I had around. Um, ready to hand. Ready to hand. Oh dear. That's bad. Um, for mouth colors. I guess I'll have a skin color. We'll do rosy skin. So, okay, wet palettes, guys, are all about mixing. I hate to say that for many of you who are mixers, um, or not mixers, rather, anti-mixers, people who are, who are not happy with mixing. Um, but yeah, wet palettes are, are very, very good for mixing. So when I use one, what I'm usually laying on down on my wet palette are not triads. They are, in fact, colors that are very far apart that I expect to be mixing. So, uh, okay, good, 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 good. It's a pride rhino. Oh, it's cute. Good morning, Nefidware. So yeah, so when I use a wet palette, it's a sign that one, I expect to be using thicker paint, which means I'm painting fast. It also means that I'm using a very large brush. Um, I couldn't find my number two uh, Da Vinci. It's around here somewhere, but I'm not sure where I put it. It's probably in my brush caddy because I so seldom use it. 
So instead, we're using a Raphael 8408 number one, which actually has a pretty fine tip, but a pretty big body. Uh, when you're using thick paint, you could use a big brush like this and no problem. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to kind of look at shadows and highlights. I'm going to kind of look at it right away before I start putting paint on. I can see I've got a nice big shadow on either side of the eyes. I see my highlights are going to be up here and I'm going to have a highlight here. Um, going to have a highlight down here on his little chin. And I'm probably going to choose to accentuate this and try to make this very dramatic. Why not, right? Um, when I start out with a wet palette. Yes, exactly. Um, hi, Major Rusa. I also haven't seen you before. Welcome. We have new faces. I like me new faces. So, okay, when I start on a wet palette, I'm going to get a, a large range of colors. So you see, I've actually got primaries laid down along with some browns. So what we've got here is we've got fresh blood, which is really close to clear red. It's fresh blood uh, 9279. Let's just put our, our paints out. Um, I grabbed my cyan blue this morning because it was just the closest thing to a clear blue I had to hand. Um, the old closest thing to a yellow that I had was NMM Gold Highlight. Since I'm good, planning to be using this as a highlighting color for the brown, uh, it's a, probably a better choice than, say, Lantern Yellow or something like that. Because uh, it's a little bit more muted, so it's going to be a better highlight mix. Uh, and then I've got uh, Walnut Brown instead of Pure Black. I've got a couple of browns here, Russet Brown and Shield Brown. So these are my primaries. So my black is actually a near black, and my white is actually a near white. And this is because this is an organic creature, and I decided I didn't want to go really, really bright. So when I'm doing these mixes, having an off-white is just fine. So I'm using actually bleached linen for that. Let me grab my, my unfortunately, my walnut brown is probably almost, uh, oh, no, it's not faded. That's right. I got a new one recently. So there are my primary colors. Um, uh... Gurgi, if you want to, I mean, I have no problem keeping my paint wet in a well palette. It's, it's your mileage may vary, right? It's, it's all, you can do everything, almost everything on both palettes. Um, but what this one is better for is if you want to use thicker paint, if you're ever going to try to build a wash or a glaze though, the wet palette is a pain in the butt. And that's why, since I'm doing a lot of fine layering, I'm doing a lot of fine blending, I'm doing a lot of washes and glazes. Um, so I, I find the wet palette overall very frustrating to use. I still make myself use it every once in a while because I find it a good exercise. And people who love the wet palette might benefit from using a well palette every once in a while as an exercise. Um, so this is, this is me just essentially saying what this is good for, in my opinion, is. Um, I don't actually find it good for daily painting. I find it good for speed painting where it forces me to do spot mixes and my paint will stay wet, even though it's thicker. When I'm speed painting, I'm using thicker paint and I'm wet blending. So wet palette is good for that, in my opinion. Oh, cool. Well, Suro, it's a weird day today because I'm using a wet palette, which I never do. So welcome, welcome. Welcome to the, the chat, the community, the overall uh, shindig today. But yeah, so uh, started out just talking about my, my quote unquote primaries, all of which are weird. Um, so the other thing I hope to talk about today, guys, and to show you is that uh, a lot of people think they have to have, you know, clear red, clear blue, clear yellow, and then black and white. These are my primaries. None of them are pure. So you can, you can still get fair enough uh, results and maybe more interesting results by kind of switching it up a little bit. If I need a brighter yellow, I've got one to hand, but for now I'm going to try to work with NMM Gold Highlight. Um, Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, back of the canopy is not is not sheets because it's the underside of the bed, right? Um, the, or the headboard. It looks, but it's the underside of the bed because these are its feet. So the mouth is actually the sheets, which makes sense, right? It wants to eat the person that's lying on it. So yeah, I couldn't do a sheet pattern on the back of the. Uh, that was the first thing I looked at. I was hoping for that. Um, twisted over, but uh, no, not so much. So it, it's the way the mimic is made. So we'll see. We'll just do it anyway. So there's my primaries, there's the colors I'm using, um, and then a couple, like I said, shield brown, russet brown, uh, or uh, russet brown is one of my normal standards. I've got a little bit of rosy skin uh, in here because we need to do his mouth. Um, and the best way to get a good mouth color is to grab a pinkish skin tone and add a little bit of red. So, he's crispies. it's weird day, it's weird day, wet palette day. There's one last shot of my paint, and then we're going to go over here. Ah, uh, and I'm going to keep them right here because I'm probably going to need more of them. I can pretty much paint a mini using just these five colors or variations thereof. I may need a little bit more shield brown, though. So, all right, let's rock this. 
So when you are using a wet palette, one of the things it really loves to do is to, is to wet blend. Uh, I did wash this model. It is not primed as usual, as per usual. Uh, so it is uh, just washed in hot water with a bit of dish soap. And then I'm using full strength paint on it, albeit, you know, full strength paint that's been on a wet palette. So a tiny bit of moisture may have wicked up into it. One of the nice things about using a wet palette in this way, if you if you really pay attention and use your dark, get break out of your your you know brain state that says you know oh that's too dark it can't do that, um, and just go for it. And the great thing about doing this this way is that of course I get to blend in highlights, shadows, and midtones straight out the gate. And don't worry about blending it, actually. Don't worry about getting a perfect blend. What you're trying to do is you're trying to set up the face of this monster. Let me get my glasses on. Um, Nomad, this is my... Uh... Nomad, this is my day to push my push out of my comfort zone. Everybody should have a day like this. Kiri, settle down. Do not do the emergency dog right now, little dog. So one thing, the one uh, one downside of wet palette is that you are using a lot of paint, so it does tend to smoosh together very fast on the figure. You may need to put down a layer and then let it dry. Settle down, Kiri. Uh oh, we may have the dog emergency earlier rather than later, guys. I'm waiting for her to settle. Settle down. I know. Good girl. Now settle down. If she's uh if she's really uncomfortable, I'll go take her out. Today is is heavy chance of dog emergency, guys, because uh, she did not uh, do everything this morning that she should have. So she may be trying to cue me by not settling down that she needs to be taken out. So I'm keeping an eye on her. I'm keeping a side eye on her. All right, vertical surfaces to the light are gonna be dark because if the light is coming from up top, I'm kind of using a mixture of russet browns and walnut at this point. And I am putting a lot of paint on the model. And that's actually, uh, that's one of the, the kind of uh, hazards of using a very large brush is it's very easy to pick up a lot of paint. So what you often will find yourself doing if you're like me is you'll end up putting a lot of paint down on the model and kind of going, oh no, that's way too much. And then backing off and letting it dry a bit and then going back. Let's see, we've got, he's got kind of sideways eyeballs. But we're getting a kind of a, a nice, you know, we've got a nice blended kind of thing. Let me get the, uh, the monster in focus because I was focused on my palette. So let me move palette out of the frame and get monster in frame. Monster, focus, monster, focus. There we go. You can see how thick my paint is. We'll bring palette back. Ah! Now, another way to use this would be to just, um, ah, and I've gotten red on myself. Why is it that when you have red on a palette, it inevitably gets all over your hand or your sleeve or your shirt or your something? Like, I swear, red is the most aggressive color. It will just go for your clothing. I do not blame myself because other lines than mine have done this. All right. Now, the other thing you can do is uh, for, to force shadows and highlights is to actually paint everything dark and then bring it all up. So let's do that with a leg. So painting everything dark will force you to think about kind of where your shadows are gonna stay when you start bringing everything up again. Um, it will give you very dramatic shadows if you leave it in the shadows, if you leave this color in the shadows and you're not gonna get the subtle effect from blending it, it's just gonna be very bold. So it depends on how high drama you're going with your uh, paint job. One thing I might do while I'm doing this is I might, uh, if I'm still painting this as if it's partially wood, whoa, this yellow is like really shifting everything. There we go. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to be able to keep the palette in frame. It's just shifting the color too much. Um, problem with yellow sponge. But the other thing I might do is keep my brush strokes vertical because if I'm going to do wood grain, that's probably the uh, direction I'm going to do it. So if I suggest a streakiness this way, I don't really don't have to worry about my blending. And now we've got some nice dark areas down here. Grab your brush, just, you know, 
block everything in. Don't worry about it. You're supposed to be painting fast with a wet palette. It enables that style. Most of the painters, I would say the vast majority of, of top level painters I know who use a wet palette paint very quickly and they utilize larger brushes and more speed and they're blocking in bigger areas because they can. Let's see. I probably need a little bit more highlight there. Boop. And I'm mixing all my colors up. Oh no. Who cares? That's the whole point of this. Do, 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 do. Oh, went too light. But everything is wet, so I can still blend it. I did not film old lines on this creature, obviously. Oh well. But the one thing I do like about the wet palette is that it encourages organic blends. So I often will get a little bit of differentiation. I'll get, you know, not exactly perfect color matching on both sides. It'll be a little bit more inexact. A lot of people will call this a more painterly style. It leaves more brush strokes. It leaves more artifacts. Um, it, you know, leaves more irregularities. It's not just perfect and symmetrical. Um, you know, and there's definitely a, a pleasing aspect to that. Um, one of the reasons that I'm trying to make myself uh, experiment more with this, though, is that it forces lighting a little bit better, I think. Um, it's a little too easy when I'm layering to bring everything up so regularly and uh, without a lot of real drama. And uh, here, it's making me think more about how the light is falling from the top of the model down. So I'm trying to just make things lighter that really are sticking out. And I'm keeping my shadows really dark because I'm mixing in this shadow color. So it's, uh, it is forcing me to go a little darker with my shadows than I normally would. Uh, so if you have a problem doing that, well, Mathavile, I think you get, you lose some of the advantage of the wet palette. Um, yeah, I'm uh, making myself suffer today. I'm grinning. I'm going, I'm, I'm walking, I'm actually walking the talk when I tell you guys to, uh, to try both things. It's been a while since I worked with wet palette. So I am, I like to knock myself out of my comfort zone every once in a while. I think it's very useful for a painter to, to embrace a tool that you're not comfortable with or that you, you really just don't like, like isn't your usual thing and to work with it, work with it until you really start getting a feel for it. And then maybe you change your mind or maybe you just reaffirm the fact that it's not really for you, but either way, you should always keep an open mind in art and uh think about oops that's way too bold do, 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 do. i do need to bring it up more though so yeah one of the things this can make you do is to uh, get much bolder with your highlights and darker with your shadows and when you're doing when you do that that's when you get those really dramatic highlight and shadows where it really does uh, show you like that the object is lit from above in a dark room and it looks so awesome and dramatic and it's like David's highlighting which I which I love and uh, need to emulate more probably let me get more make sure let me get down oh oh twitch chat is a little bit weird for me right now hold on uh, Major Ursa, I really don't like it. Uh, the reason I don't like it is that it does not do thinned paint applications. Uh, it does not allow you, you can see I'm using full strength paint on this sucker. Um, and I, if you try to thin paint on a wet palette, your paint will not stay at the proper consistency for more than a couple brush strokes. Because while this paint sits here, it's wicking fluid up from the sponge and fluid also goes the other way. So depending on the paper that you're using and stuff like that, you can't keep your paint at a standard consistency on this wet palette if it's very thin. It also keeps you from doing a, a nice big puddle of like if I was going to layer highlights on with a lighter brown here, I couldn't make a nice big puddle of that on here. It's just going to go everywhere. Uh, so for me, because I use a lot of layering, a lot of glazing and a lot of thin paint applications where I'm really thinning my paint down, um, it doesn't work for me. So this is me totally going outside of my usual painting style with this, this wet palettes are good for thicker paint 
faster blending. You can do thinned applications with them. Obviously, really good painters use wet palettes for everything, right? But it's harder because I have to mix every brushful. See, now you can see, actually, this paint was a little stronger when I started. I haven't actually picked up any water on my brush, but this paint is now getting a lot thinner. It's pulling water up. So this is the problem with wet palettes is if you want to do, you can do spot glazes really easily, but you're going to be mixing every brush full. And sometimes you want to do that. If you want a more painterly style, if you don't want a, a you know, a, a more, I don't know if you're looking, if you, painterly is the best way to put it. If you want to show brush strokes and to have irregularities and have different, different highlights and shadows uh, and a more organic feel, then wet palette excels. Um, if you're trying for pre precision, if you're trying to do smooth blends, then you're going to suffer a little bit. It's going to make it harder for you. That's why I always tell everybody on this stream, use both. Learn to use both. Because that way, when you need your smooth blending, you can switch to your well palette, which is going to make it a little easier for you. Uh, and when you want to do like a lot of glazing or, or really fine layering, but then you can just go back to this for, you know, everything else that you're comfortable with. Um, let's see here. This is a, a bed mimic, actually. Yeah. Or a mocking beast, sorry. Bed mocking beast. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, you can totally watch previous streams. Uh, it's on our YouTube channel. And uh, sometimes it takes a couple days to get posted, Neelok. Um, it depends. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I only do a few lessons usually on each creature, Neelok. Um, I don't actually finish the model because uh, what we find is that people get bored with it. Um they want to see something different and you can't use like, usually there's a specific uh, round of techniques that you can use on a given model. And so when you get past that, then it's just repetition of stuff that you've done before, like more scales or more, you know, more, um, you know, well, with Rocky, it really is more scales or wings or whatever. So at that point, uh, we tend to lose viewership a little bit because people just kind of, you know, they get disinterested, they wander off. Um, but yeah, like for things like glazing, it's very hard for me to do that with this palette. All right, so so we've got some setup here. I'm going to move this again because it totally makes the color wrong. All right, so you can see how rough this is, right? You can see brush strokes. Absolutely. You can, you, those of you who watch normally know that normally I do not have near this level of brush strokes showing. Um, and so any blending that I do here is necessarily going to be just a little choppier than my normal blending. And that's wet palette. That's the way it is. Um, cause I have to mix everything by hand. And if, and if you don't have a really, really good feel for your wet palette and how thin your paint needs to be to get that smooth blend every time on your brush, you're going to leave brush strokes. And, and so at that point, what a lot of painters will do is they'll get into textures, right? And like I'm the streaky pattern that I'm doing here, I can turn into wood grain. It looks very organic. It's good on this monster. But if I was trying to do smooth cloth blending or a smooth skin, it would make it a very hard for me. It would make it a lot harder. So every tool has a niche where it excels. And then, you know, it may be good or indifferent at other things or even bad at other things. In the case of the wet palette, I think that it is uh, possible to get smooth blends, but that you have to have really have a handle on your paint consistency. Yeah, Lebrowski. Do do do. Wet palette it is. Hey, Valander. I am painting a bed mimic, bed mocking beast. I am a wet paletting, and I am doing the back of this because it shows you guys how keeping this. How essentially moving from a very light color with this and keeping a very dark color also on your palette for all shadows, for this is walnut brown, gives you a much more dramatic appearance here. Um, just a more dramatic appearance, um, organic appearance. So, all right, so let's go to do the side of the guy. And he's going to have a heavy shadow under his little arm there, i.e. bedpost. And this is also... A little bit of a concave area that kind of goes inward so I'm going to shadow that then I'm going to start bringing it up a bit down here with my shield brown and my russet brown and if I leave my paint a little thin I can almost get a wash effect with here come on guy come on up sit stay ah nope gotta put the whole hand there Sometimes, camera, you annoy me. Yeah, there. 
So you can see how if my paint's a little thinner, I can kind of get a little bit of an impromptu wash effect there. Let's see here. Well, yeah, but Scarlet, you can do glazing with your wet palette, but it won't be precise, right? So it depends on your style. And this is always what I say. Wet palette's not inferior. It's very good at some things. But to be consistent with your glazing, like if you were making trying to make a big pool of glaze and doing something across a very large area like a dragon wing, it might be hard for you to get an even coat that was the same every time. Unless you've just got worked with your wet palette enough and gotten a really good instinctual grasp of it. But I find it very difficult um, to do large areas like that. It could be parchment paper. Um... It could be whatever. I like to use actually a more absorbent paper normally. I am using parchment today. Uh, but it still will, It this will change the consistency of your paint. So you can glaze, your glazes just won't be consistent. For me, that annoys me because I want, I know exactly the consistency I want. I know exactly the effect I want and I want my paint to stay there so that I can do a large area. And wet palette won't do that for me. I have to mix every brush full. You can do it, it's just different. It takes a little bit more work in some ways and a little less work in others. So it really is, it's up to you. It's good for this, bad for that. This is why I don't like it. I prefer to have really good control and make a big puddle of what I need so that I can tune it. Um, you know, so it, it all, it's all up to you. Hello, hello, hello. Let's see, more stuff, more stuff. Let's see here. Yeah, math of file, the blue shift, the camera will blue shift if I put my wet palette under with the wet, with the um, yellow sponge. That's why a lot of people are annoyed about it and they'll put a piece of wet palette, white paper underneath the parchment. But I didn't care about that, that much. You guys know how to use a wet palette, right? You use it. So it's got drops of paint and I'm grabbing them and wet blending them on the model. Um, yes, Vallejo is, is much thicker than Reaper, Major, uh, Major Ursa. Vallejo takes a lot more water to get it to a, a point where you can do like really smooth skin tones with layering and stuff like that. I used to use Vallejo. Before I went to Reaper and made their paint line, I used a lot of Vallejo because that was the best paint at the time. Um, do, 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 do. Let me see here. But, but yeah, it's like, it, and in, like, I, like I always say, it's all your style. You should try both, but before you try both, understand what the strengths are for both, right? Because like the advantage of a well palette is that you can mix a thinned paint, like if you're layering, if, you're, if I was doing layering wood grain on this whole monster, I would want a big puddle of that brown at the right consistency to get the results that I wanted. And so oh, I think Kiri's gonna have an, uh, a moment, guys. All right, um, I warned everybody at the start, my dog might have a emergency where I needed to rush her outside and she definitely looks uncomfortable right now. So I'm going to do that. We're gonna to go to the be, back, be right back screen. Um, chat amongst yourselves about stuff. I will try to be back as fast as I can with Kiri, okay? Hold on.
Bam. All right. We're back, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for entertaining yourselves for like five minutes or seven there. Ah, old dog. Old dog has, has moments. You know how it goes. Let me get my earplug in. There. Now I can hear anybody talking. Let me see here. Do, 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 do. Hey, Achilles. I missed you. Yeah, I, that's the, the Masterson wet pilot paper meth file. I like that too. Um, well, you can do that too. I mean, that's what I normally do, Francis, is I use full strength on a, a well palette. But the downside there is that the well palette, in the well palette, full strength paint is going to dry a lot faster. Um, just because. So if you're going to use full strength, because uh, when you're thinning your paint, you're adding water, right? So it, essentially it, it creates a more fluid surface. You're, you're loading more water in there and you're making a bigger puddle. And so you have less surface area exposed to the air. So by adding water to your paint in your well palette, you are essentially uh, making it stay at that consistency for longer. But if you use full strength paint in your well palette, unless you're using a very big puddle of it, even then, because you don't have as much water loaded into it, it's going to dry and get goopy and thick a lot faster because you just don't have as much fluid. Um, so that's why I say that wet palettes really excel if you want to use thicker paint mixtures, especially like this to get a base coat down on a model um, and to, to get a blended base coat down with some texture and some highlights and shadows. Um, and when you're wet blending, all that stuff uh, likes thicker paint applications. And so it's very good for that when you're using, even when you're doing like Sergio does and just building up from a shadow base coat and building up several layers of highlights, that's where you're using thicker paint. And so the wet palette excels because it's going to keep your paint wet. Hopefully that made sense. Uh, not really that I've noticed Sharky. I don't know. David, does there a specific grain to uh, parchment paper on a wet palette? Or does parchment not really have a, a grain per se? Like putting it down in a specific direction. I don't think it matters. You don't think it matters? All right. He's the expert. Had to ask. <laughs> Me, I just threw this parchment down because I, I had it. I didn't have any prepped wet palette paper. But most people use uh, parchment anyway. It's going to curl at the edges no matter what. Sharky, just uh, essentially put it down, get it all wet, flip it over, get it all wet, and then smooth the edges down until they get saturated, and then it'll stop curling. Uh, my favorite Reaper miniature right now is probably Frost Giant Queen, just because I actually cared enough about her to get a resin. Uh, do, 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 do. I like it because she has lots of smooth cloth that I can do freehand on, and she also has a nice amount of detail. And I like her Celtic... Um, Pseudo-Celtic Norse um, knot work that Izzy drew on. Uh, yeah, the puppy was... Puppy's empty now, I hope. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I have no idea if many painters are more likely to have cats or dogs. I think uh, we're, we tend to be animal people just because I know so many people, so many uh, mini painters with animals. But then that's just humans, right? We a lot. Their pets are common. Let's see here. Do, do, do. I'm catching up on chat. Uh, Mathophile oil painting has been a thing for miniatures for a very, very long time. Um, historical figure painters have used oils specifically for skin, but it used to be for everything uh, for decades, <laughs> really. Um, so oil painting is definitely a thing. A lot of them still use it on skin because it gives a more luminous and kind of a, a semi-gloss finish, uh, which works for skin. Uh, and you also, uh, you know, that you've got some of the colors in tube oil paints, uh, work really well for skin, like burnt, uh, burnt sienna, things like that. Uh, do, do, do. Yeah. Oil paints. Uh, yeah, you can definitely do it on minis. Just be, keep in mind the drying time. Let's see here. Do, 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 do. Uh, let's see here. Thank you for the plug for Reaper Paints, Lebrowski. Let's see here. Getting down, getting down. Man, we got people. You got people started on Pets of Planner, and now it's like. Uh, it's the, the I won't I will never catch up to chat. Not ever. Hey Sig Wolf, I'm using a wet palette. It's crazy. Uh, wedding agents. Yeah, I do a very strong opinion actually, Mathphile. Um, if you're on my Patreon, I actually did a thing on Reaper additives. Wedding agents I find are not generally necessary when working on a wet palette, especially because you already you've got your uh, your wedding agent is your wet palette. 
Um, and uh, the, the okay, so in if you live in a very arid area and you like to do wet blending, then a wetting agent may be necessary. But in general, to the thing to remember about them is that you should use very little, really little, because it will it will um, change the finish of the paint to be more glossier potentially if you use too much. And the other thing it does is it hurts adhesion, like it really impacts adhesion. Um, so your paint will rub off easier if you use too much wetting agent. So anything that's like a slow dry medium or a drying retarder, uh, be very cautious. Use a tiny bit um, and figure out the sweet spot because it will definitely impact your paint. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Yeah, so essentially mathophile, I never use them. I don't, I don't want to risk it. I don't need it. Since I normally am doing wet on dry, um, especially I don't need it. So for me, if the paint dries fast, it's a, it's a plus, it's a feature. Ah, I just loaded my brush up with water because I'm used to having to wet down my paints. No, get out of my brush, out of my brush water. All right, let's get back to getting this guy down. So really dark shadow there. And what we're going for today is dramatic, right? Because wet palette actually does that. Uh, for me, that's one of the advantages of working with a wet palette for my personal style is that I tend to be timid about getting really dark shadows next to bright highlights. And I have found that the wet palette, it um, encourages me to do really dark shadows. Uh, so sometimes just to get out of my own head, I embrace the wet palette just to get more dramatic effects. Today, I'm just like, I felt like just switching up my style a little bit. Doing something a little different. So I'm, I wanted to bring up his feet here because they will catch the light, but I don't want to bring it up too much. I, I, do, I want to keep my dark shadow there. And again, if, you, um, if you're painting something like this, so you know you're going to probably use thicker paint, leave some brush strokes. Um, you can always leave the brush strokes purposefully in the direction of like, like if you're doing wood grain or you're doing cloth texture, kind of make sure your brush strokes are in harmony with that. Um, and it uh, can save you some work down the road and uh, create a very pleasing effect out the gate. There. We'll just put a little bit more yellow onto my mimic knees. Mimic knees. I guess mimics do have knees. Look at that. They do. Uh, let's see here. Thoughts on sealants. Oh, I never seal them, Trashorama, unless I'm shipping them. Uh, I actually don't use a sealer on any of my competition pieces. Um, Especially a spray sealer can sometimes knock your highlights down a little bit. I used to use Tester's Dull Coat when I used to use Vallejo because Vallejo is a little bit of a softer paint and so it tends to rub off easier. Um, but Master Series is, is uh, such a high acrylic content paint in general compared to the other brands that I find I usually don't need it in a display model. Um, so I just don't even take the chance that it's going to change the finish or um, make my highlights a little dimmer or, you know, affect, affect it in any way. Um, I generally, when I'm painting a competition model, I, I'm concentrating on what, how the finish looks right out of the gate. So I don't want to apply anything that's going to change the finish. That is my own personal opinion. All right, let's get some, this is a little lighter. It's going to catch the light a little bit here. This is where you can really pay attention to the contours of the model on where you're going to pop your really dark shadows, get some contrast in. It does really let me block in a model fast, and I really do appreciate that about it. Like I said, not my usual shtick, but I decided I was going out of my comfort zone this uh, today. Maybe even this week. Maybe we'll uh, maybe we'll do wet palette all week. By the end of it, I'll be ready to strangle people, <laughs> or strangle my wet palette. I'm not sure which. It's not very effective to strangle a wet palette though. All right, got to get my shadow darker. Now remember, this is the point of the wet palette. Get really dark shadows in. Let's see here. Good orange for that bright orange highlight color that shows up in really ginger red hair. Um, use a real, use a regular orange. I mean, uh, you could use highlight orange and then mix in, set, like say sunrise orange. But honestly, Sig Wolf, if you look at that, I mean, it's it's oh, you almost want to do a white highlight. Uh, or an off-white highlight and then glaze uh, like a, almost a clear orange over it. I mean, because it's, it's the highlight, right? Because it's that particular orange where the strands really look like they're set on fire in a, in a really red-haired person. 
um, is where the light is passing through the hair and it's really illuminating it. So if you have to go to a real orange for it, then go for it. Do, 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 do. But yeah, I mean, if you need a more vibrant orange, go to clear orange. And then if that is too bright, saturated, and not realistic enough, maybe grab highlight orange from the red hair triad if you've got it. If you don't have that, mix some of your orange with a tiny bit of rust brown, 9072, uh, and uh, go that way. Because you can always put a little bit of a burnt orange color in to knock down the, the clear orange. All right, here. I want to see, where's my sweet spot here? Right about there. All right. I'll try to remember to paint him here. Doo -doo -doo. And I definitely have some sculpted wood grain here. So I'm going to make sure you can see I'm making sure my brush strokes actually go in the direction of that. So that if I do leave brush strokes with uh, the wet palette and all that, it's uh, in line with what I would want, where I would want those highlights to be. So we want to keep our dark shadows dark. I might not need that quite so dark right there. This is going to be highlighted. That's going to be dark. Um, as with every other time I paint, if you've got any of these under areas to do, and I just did a video on this actually on Patreon, um, just block them in with a dark brown. Any of these under underneath areas that nobody's really going to look at, block them in a walnut. You can always add a little bit of texture if you can reach the area easily. Um, but you don't have to worry about that under area adding a lot of detail to it here. This one is pretty rough because it's got a lot of underside, right? But you can see how dark it is. Even when I put it here, I haven't painted that area, but it still looks really dark. So really what you need to do is just grab a bunch of walnut and smoosh it, smoosh it down in there on that underside of that mimic. And that's all you need to do to the underside. Let's see here. But yeah, be aware of how light your lights and how dark your darks are on the, the paints that you're actually setting up on your wet palette. Because if you don't include any really dark colors on your wet palette, you're not going to use any and you're going to miss out on a lot of contrast. Especially when you get all in that. I like to kind of have all my colors open so I can play with stuff as I go. And it's not going to dry out because it's on a wet palette. So once you have it there, it's there. Get more shadows here. There's quite a dark uh, an edge here that delineating the back of the under what would be the underside of the bed, but now is upright um, between the side of the bed here. And I'm just wet blending here because wet palettes really do excel at it. But as I said, there are plenty of painters who will use thicker paint, but who won't wet blend, who will, who will lay down their layers, um, in stages, you know, just like we do. And maybe their layers are a little closer together, um, then, you know, then with layering, you can get away with, uh, your layers being a little further apart if you thin your paint a lot, but with, um, the thicker the paint you use, the less translucency you get. So the less you can get away with that. The thicker the paint you use, the more um, close your colors need to be to pull off a good blend. Now you can always glaze afterwards if you you know to help with that, right? That's true of any any miniatures, uh, whatever palette application you're using. So really, you can do everything on everything. The only thing I think that is really hard on a wet palette, like I said, is big puddles of glaze or wash, where the wet palette just tends to wanna pull that moisture back down or thin the paint more. Um, so you can do everything on everything. It's just the, your style. What's your style, right? And if you do tend to use a wet palette all the time, or you tend to use a well palette all the time, like me, it can help you switch up your style and get out of ruts to try consciously to use the other type of palette and to learn what it's good at for you, right? Because some people will use their wet palette for entirely different kind of things than others. Like uh, everybody's got a favorite, a reason why they like the palette they do. And they're often quite different. And it could be as easy as I grew up using this. And so this is, you know, the way I learned to paint. And this, so that's what I, that's what I like. Cause I know how it acts, right? You know, by the time you, you've gotten to be like, say an intermediate or slightly above that painter, 
you're probably used to either a wet or a well palette and you know how it works. You know how to make it set up and do tricks and to get the effects you want. And so it can be very hard that at that point to switch, right? So I grew up being very much a well palette painter. Um, and so it's very hard for me to adapt to wet palette and to, uh, it helped a lot when I realized when I took this, um, a workshop with Sergio, um, Calvo Rubio, uh, who is an excellent painter from Spain. Sergio's workshop was very useful for me because it showed me that for me, it showed me where the wet palette fit in my, my kind of painting. Um, it showed me where its strengths and weaknesses were for my kind of painting, for the, for the painting I tend to do. And so that in that it was incredibly useful. And so no matter what level you are at, I encourage you, if one of the, one of the European painters is in town and doing workshop, even though they tend to be pricey, they can be very worth it for you if you are at least at an intermediate level. Um, because if you pay attention, you can get gems like that. Because that's always, even for us, uh, people who might be a higher level painter who are going in, some people are like, well, why are you even taking this workshop? You know, you're good on your own. But yeah, but the reason for me to take them is to learn a different style or to learn how the tools that they use function so that maybe I can adapt part of this for my style. Or just get more comfortable, in this case, with a tool that I was very uncomfortable with, i.e. the wet palette. But can be very useful if you, uh, also if you were uh, in a rut to get out of your rut. Yeah, I mean, Arizona is its own beast, right, Mathophile? That's why I say in, in, that's why I said specifically about retarders, if you are in a very dry climate, the wet palette may not be enough. You may need to add, add it, but add just a little, really. Yeah. See, Mimic? There, sorry. Have, have David coming to see my Mimic. See? I was actually looking at how you were using the wet palette. Oh. That's, that's so new to me that you are painting on a wet palette. Yep, it's weird. I pretty it's... much use it just like a traditional painter would use it, like a 2D, like a... I, I use it like James Gurney uses it. You lose. I mean, right now you're using it basically the same way you would use a well palette. In a way, yeah. I haven't done any cross mixes yet and made cross mix colors to do because I'm using a lot of wet blending because I'm on a textured surface. Interesting. Yeah. So, so for me, I like it, and this is actually the way Sergio also uses it. I mean, he does some spot blends, but in general, he's working with puddles of color and building up layers. Right. He's mm -hmm. just he's just mixing his layers, whereas I haven't mixed any layers yet because I'm working on the wood. Ah, down he goes. The mimic ran. So David's called me out. Now I have to like actually uh, mix colors together on my uh, my palette. Although I actually have been doing some mixing, you just can't see it because I have been mixing a lot of my shield brown into my uh, my yellow here for my highlights. I think he just wasn't looking close enough. Alrighty, everybody's a critic. <laughs> So if we're going to pull a Sergio, Sergio would lay down his shadow color and then he would, then he would mix a color that was like a next step up, like maybe a little bit of the shadow color plus my russet brown or my shield brown. And he would do that and he would leave a little bit of the shadow color and then he would grab and mix the next stage up, maybe some shield brown mixed into russet brown and he would go in with that and still, you know, retain a little bit. And he would just generally bring up, he it's really layering, um, but it's layering with thick paint and leaving texture. And then at the end you glaze um, to bring everything together. But you can do a succession of thick highlights that are really just like a topographical map. I want a little bit too much there. And you're trying you're trying to get it to look right, you're, but you're also going for high drama. You want a lot of contrast if you're doing the Sergio method, because that's the point, is to go from almost black up to your top highlight. Let's see. So go really, really... This is not a good... I should have used uh, done like one on this, but... But then the glaze to bring it all together when you've got your layers. He just really paints it like, and you guys know what I mean by topographical map, right? Where you're essentially going and you're painting. Say this is a, say this is like a muscle mass. And then you put on your next layer, which is close to your previous layer, 
a little lighter. And you're leaving some walnut around the edges. And then you're grabbing your next layer, which might be shield brown. And most of the time you're you know, like letting these dry. You're not actually trying to squish it on really, really fast like I am. And you're making that layer even smaller. So you're leaving some russet brown around the edges. And then maybe you mix your shield brown with your uh, NMM gold highlight to get a middle color. And again, you're going on and you're being, yeah. So you're doing like that. You're making a topographical map. And unfortunately, the different layers aren't showing, but essentially layer, 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 you know, and then maybe in the middle, you put a really bright layer. I don't know, whatever. But then after you do that, you um, glaze to bring all your layers together. And the advantage of doing it this way is that with thicker paint, you can move faster. Um, and lay down your, you're not worrying about blending. You're just blocking your highlight from shadow to highlight transitions. And then you glaze to bring it all together. Um, you usually don't get as smooth an effect, but you get a fast, fast effect. You get very fast results. And then you can fine tune everything if you want to. So I'm kind of doing that here. You can see I've got dark and I've got some transitions going on. And then I can essentially just glaze or wash once I have my highest highlight on and uh, it'll make this these brush strokes blend together a bit better. I'm also adding a few more strokes. Um, you know, it's, uh, I wouldn't make a, I wouldn't make a, 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 a hybrid of the two Sig Wolf. Actually, the best hybrid is the one that David is testing out for a company right now, um, which is essentially a wet palette, but it has magnetized wells that you can stick on the side of it. So you can actually use the advantage of the well palette as well. So when you need to build a wash or a glaze or in a large volume, then you can, uh, utilize those wells. I don't think there's a reason. I mean, as somebody who is a long-term well palette user, I have no problem with my paint staying wet for hours if I'm actively working with it in a well palette. I really don't. So I don't think there's a point for me in, I mean, if you made a well palette that, that leached water like a wet palette, I would say you had the worst of both worlds, not the best. Yeah, well, Sethany, that's David with my painting style on everything. I just, well, that's interesting. <laughs> you know, in other words, you're doing it wrong. But I'll say, that's interesting. <laughs> it's all good. He paints, he and I paint just so differently from each other that it's it's inevitable that we have very strong opinions about each other's painting. Um, I do love his painting, though. I love the strong highlights and shadows that he gets. And so I want to... Uh, try to push myself a bit more on that in the future. It's one of my resolutions as a painter. I still don't like things with too many brush strokes. I still really love smooth. Um, and some painters don't like, he's not a big fan of like really smooth stuff. Uh, I can't help it. It's just the style that I like. And I mean, you shouldn't paint us in a style that you don't like, right? I mean, don't let anybody tell you that your style is wrong or that it's boring or that it's, you know, so 1995. Um, do what you like and just do it well. And then they all have to shut up when you win awards doing it. <laughs> but yeah, there's always going to be, just like in the art world, there's always going to be hotly contested uh, opinions, painter to painter, about varying uh, techniques and uh, things like palettes and brushes and uh, smoothness versus texture and you know, all this, all this sort of thing. And really, I mean, just find the way that you like and do it is the bottom line. I've uh, got to make my upper surface a lot lighter up here. I'm going to lose all my shadows. Shadow goes on the vertical surfaces because if the light is falling from above, then that's going to be shadowed or at least not as light. This monster ha is all over the place. Justin, are you here now? Did I hear a burble? Was that you? Sorry, I thought I heard a Discord wobble. 
but I could be wrong. You did, Miss Anne. Oh, I did. There's our Justin. Everybody can now say hi to Justin. We got through the dog emergency thanks to Planer and uh, everybody starting to talk about their animals. There was a dog emergency? Yeah, uh, yep, there was. Uh, Curie feeling. Um, I, she emptied herself and now she is snoozing again. Ah, uh... uh, yeah, that, that, that's interesting is David for that's not how I do it. Yes, Sigwolf, yeah, you're right. Yeah, exactly. Well, because it's really not, it's not bad. It's just not your style, right? So you you always have to keep that in mind. Just because somebody's painting in a style that isn't yours doesn't mean it's bad or that you should encourage them. Like, they could come out with something that's totally weird and awesome. You never know. Uh, let's see. Just keep working on it, dog father. Hey, there you go, Justin. You've got a chorus of hellos. Hello, everyone. Yeah, I like com competitions, Mathophile. Um, I do. I, I do feel I, I. I am capable of being, you know, quite competitive as far as my emotional state goes. But I actually like uh, competitions because they give me a reason to push myself. Sometimes I feel like I get too lazy. Um, in my painting, and although I like the stuff I'm painting, I could do better. Um, but that's more effort, and so for me, competitions are a way to motivate myself to push myself. Because when you get to a certain level where, you know, you can paint a model and it looks good, you know, you might just stop there, and that's fine. But I have always felt, and maybe it's, you know, being an artist from early days, but I've always wanted to push myself to be the best I can be. Um, and so... For me, I like having that competition as an excuse to try something new, to push myself to do something better that I know I can get there. But, you know, that's that's me. I, I, I always like to see how far I can go at something that I put a lot of time into. Otherwise, I wouldn't have spent so much time on it. It's different if you're running a game and you're like, if you really just love painting monsters, do a good standard on the tabletop so your players will be terrified that is awesome too that's just just my personal philosophy of, of competitions is they they are what competitions are what motivated me to get as good as i am now um without golden demons um and the encouragement of other painters who were also competing i wouldn't have gotten near this good i wouldn't have been motivated to do it because it does take time and effort um and a lot of, you know, paying attention and trying, you know, trying to analyze other things and trying to get better and, and figuring out how to get better. And a lot of painting, right? A lot of practice to get better. So, yeah, without... And it also uh, it did also introduce me to a whole community of awesome people, you know, who are now my friends and co-teachers, co-instructors at conventions. Um, so it, it was also, competition is also fun that way. So I think the spirit of competition that's perhaps the proper one is to use it as an incentive to yourself to try something new or to push yourself a little if you're just, you know, in the happy rut of where you are and maybe you'd rather try to do something new. Sometimes composition can be good. It also gives you a deadline, so it makes you finish things. That's the best, that's the best world, right? Image of Betrayal? Is if you and your uh, significant other both both really like each other's styles. David really likes my sacrifice bus. So he likes it when I paint to top level. The problem is that more often I don't have a lot of time to paint to top level these days. So it's uh, it seems like it, it's something you have to make time for. And I, I did I have said before I actually noted noted this the other day that not having any competitions right now because all the cons were canceled this year has really really trashed my urge to paint competition level. <laughs> Uh, because I don't have a competition to paint for, so. Yeah. What? What was that half no that half noise? David made a disparaging noise at me. I'm, I'm also disgruntled about the lack of competitions. Yeah. I was commiserating. Yeah. Okay, that was a commiserative noise. Okay, cool. Yeah, it is. Uh, because we definitely, yeah, we both use competitions as motivation to get things done and to paint uh, and push ourselves a little bit. So. 
So yeah, not having competitions mean Anne and David have been playing a lot of Path of Exile. <laughs> but that's all going to change when my new order arrives. Oh, that's day. right. Yes, yes. We have both ordered some really gorgeous models lately, and so we are uh, utilizing that to get excited instead. We can always think about next year. We can hope the conventions will be back next year. Yeah, I mean, in some ways it's a good opportunity to do a larger project because you don't have anything this year, but it's going to come back next year. So that means you have like a full year to work on something amazing. Yes, that's true. That is really true. That's why I should be working on my Frost Giant Queen. Because she's a bigger project with more basing than I normally do on a figure. Yeah, it is a really good opportunity to do something a little bit larger in scope than your usual, whether that means a diorama or whether that means a larger scale figure or whatever. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, ReaperCon is doing a painting con competition. We're just not doing... Oh, um, is it? Well, yeah, it's just not doing the the Master Series Open. It's not using the MSP Open format. We're just going to do something, I think, on social media. And uh -huh. I don't know the details. They're hashing it all out, so... Okay, good. But, yeah. I, I was worried they weren't going to do anything. No, no. We're going to do, a, con we're gonna do okay. a contest. We're, we're at least going to do maybe a bigger, broader version of our usual Facebook competitions. I'm just not sure. I have not heard from Ed on this, guys. Don't quote me. I don't know. I don't know if you know, Justin. Yeah. I, I will say that it's probably going to lean more towards showcase and less towards contest. Okay, so more more showcase, less contest. So everybody show off your best figures kind of thing? Yeah. yeah. Now, whether or not even that changes, well... Right. Yeah. I mean, we've got months to go, and, and we do tend to... Things evolve a lot. That's why when you ask us about ReaperCon early, guys, uh, everything changes by the time ReaperCon comes, because... Uh, it's constantly evolving. I mean, Reaper, uh, some things are nailed down very early, but then other things, you know, maybe somebody gets a, maybe Ed gets a really good idea toward the end of things, and so we switch it up. You know, stuff like that happens all the time. So we don't know. We'll figure it out. When there's an official announcement and rules set or guidelines set, then you'll know. But yeah, maybe I should uh, finish my Frost Giant Queen for that then. Maybe I should make that my deadline. Because it really does help. <laughs> Competitions really do help me set deadlines for myself. And I was just thinking that I wanted to work on the mural on her. on the Or, or the freeze or the fresco or the whatever I decide to do up on her archway of her base. Which does remind me, Miss Anne. Yes. A uh, little, little off topic. Yeah. But uh, this weekend was the POE launch. What did you guys, did you guys play? Yes. Oh gosh. We've been playing a lot actually. Since it was my birthday weekend, I took the weekend off and we played Path of Exile uh, pretty much uh, a lot. Uh, David ended oh, up playing a lot birthday. more. Yeah. Yeah. That was yesterday. Um, I had a good birthday. Uh, David ended up playing a lot more than me because he didn't like his initial build on one character. So <laughs> I've been there. You've oh, been man, there. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, I did that for this league. I, oh, I started did you? off with a, uh, with a melee build that I didn't like and ended up making a new one halfway through Sunday. Oh yeah. Yep. 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 Yeah, that's uh, I, that's what's happening with David too. Justin said he ended up uh, making a melee build he didn't like, and then starting a new build halfway through yesterday. So he should have known better. <laughs> yes, he should have. You know what? He's not wrong. I've played <laughs> enough of this game. He's right, one hundred percent. Yes, you've played enough of the game. He is right. Yes, he says you're not wrong. Um, but yeah, so otherwise, I actually I committed to a build early, and it turned out to be super fun. So I have one character that I really like so far. Um, so yeah, I, I did my, uh, ice storm, um, this, the whispering ice staff. So it's cyclone ice storm. Uh, it's always scary for those builds that really don't get going until the thirties or forties because you're playing for hours without really knowing whether you're going to like the build. Yeah. Putting a lot of time into yeah. it. Yeah. But I like mine. It's spin to win. I spin in circles and I cast blizzard nonstop or ice storm nonstop and I uh, mulch things. And so, yeah, I think, I think that's really my fun level. Ah, but you're enjoying it. Yeah, I am. Good. I good. mean, it's, it's a very easy build really. Okay. So I play with people and maybe the rest of you, um, on here can, can sympathize maybe if you're not one of the best video gamers in the world. Uh, but I, I play with people who are usually much better at video games than me. And so my priority for a build in a game like Path of Exile is, uh, can I keep up with everyone and not die? And so I built a rather tanky build this time so that I can keep up with everybody and not die and be happy. And so far, this is mostly the case. And I think it'll get better as I get more higher level. So 
so yeah, but uh, I'm always in that case where uh, where everybody is kind of a little bit better at the game than me because maybe they understand it a little more. They put more time into it because I just tend to stumble into these things and go, wee! <laughs> I think the only game that I've really ever tried to get better at and really tried to be competitive at is WoW, back when I was raiding. But even then, there was just a little bit of me that was just going, wee, <laughs> and not really, uh, you know, committing as hardcore as people I knew. Ooh, the new summer board game releases from Target. Cool trash drama. Thanks for the late birthday wishes, Karniko. No, no. My build was not inspired by anything other than I wanted to play, um... I always liked to play, play spellcasters, math and file. So I pretty much looked at stuff until I saw something that looked pretty and, uh, and fun. And then I went for it. Hey, Sharka, you'll have to... Oh, thank you for the raid, uh, Erdely. That's awesome. Oh, yeah! Thanks for the raid, Erdely. We're, we're a little bit... We went a little bit off topic and stopped talking painting and started talking video games and board games. But, you know, it happens. So, hi. Hi, everybody. I am painting a mimic, or a, uh, as we call them, a mocking beast that is a bed that has come to life. And I'm using a wet palette, which is not usual for me. I actually use a well palette. Like, for all my life, I've used a well palette. Um, but I do try to, like, push myself out of my comfort zone every once in a while. So I was showing people how you can use this to, you know, maybe create more, uh, more extreme shadows and highlights and get a little more drama on your figures and also how you can wet blend with it and things like that. We were talking about the merits of palettes and p thickness of paint and what things are good at. Stuff like that. Also, oh, Sharky, yeah. you'll have to, uh, you'll have to add me cause I, I've played a, uh, I've actually I've probably put about 500 hours in this uh, Tarkov at this point. That's all I was playing at one point. I remember when you were playing a lot of that. You mentioned it. It's actually what I was playing up yeah. until the PoE League. Um, oh, yeah. Out, actually, this weekend, yeah. We were playing a lot of Overwatch before PoE, just because I really love the game. And David is, again, better at it than me, but it's uh, it's fun. It's, it's a good time. Alrighty. Hey. Uh trash is that the uh, the meme you sent me with ron if it is i did chuckle and i actually sent that around um i blasted that out in an email chain to them oh my, a ron all... meme you're not sharing yes. it well i wanted to make sure that uh that they weren't for whatever reason you know offended by uh, it and yeah yeah offended or although ron found it hilarious <laughs> and uh, i haven't heard back from gene yet and i think proctor's still camping which reminder by the way to the people in chat that uh, Clever Crow's show will not be airing tomorrow because, you know... Uh, he's out in the wilderness? He's out in the wilderness. Yeah, he cannot stream from out in the wilderness. Although it would be kind of cool to have campfire, campfire stream with Proctor. See, he should, he should just Honestly, set up a hotspot. that hot would spot. be cool. Yeah. I agree with you. That would be a... Like, he'd have to find a hotspot or something. But, yeah. That could be fun. All right. I am... I am... Uh, it, uh, delineating my mimic's mouth at this point. I've darkened in his eyes so that I can make them like bright red or blue or something. And uh, I'm just shading right now around the bed frame where it would be in shadow because if the light is falling from here, this recessed area would be dark. So that's why we're blocking it in walnut. Maybe I will bring this guy back tomorrow. I really wanted to get to his mouth. And I didn't get to his mouth at all. So let's try to move what we got. Uh, yeah, I've got maybe 15 minutes. Let's try to block things in fast. I need more um, shield brown, though. Where is it? There it is. I was actually mixing colors on my wet palette, David. Um, but you just can't see them because I'm using tiny little mixes. I'm not using, like, big brush strokes. So, all right. Let's block some stuff in. This is just using the wet palette like a regular palette at this point. Got some shield brown out. Going to lay it down fast. Um, once again, for new people, I have not primed this model. This is just straight up. On Bones models, I don't prime them. Uh, I just washed it with some hot water and dish soap and let it dry. And uh, the paint, as you can see, even when it is thinner, the paint is sticking just fine. So you really don't have to prime your bones. I, I am a proponent of not priming your bones. Rawr, says the Mimic. Rawr! Do, 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 do. He is fun. Do, 
do do. All right, so we've got some shadow colors. This is where we start blocking in. We definitely have a shadow under here. Remember to make your shadows dark if you want a lot of uh, dramatic effect. So I'm using straight up walnut. Walnut brown 9136, one of my go to use it on every darn model colors. And that's that's been true ever since the days of Reaper Pro Paint. I think a lot of people were just like enamored of walnut brown and have used it all over the place. Then we gotta block in some shadows underneath this tendril here. So we cast a shadow. A little bit more shadow over here. If my paint was dry, I'd be doing mixes and applying it. But uh, since my paint is wet, I'm just wet blending for the most part here. Mm, let's see here. There's an old video of Jeremy Bonamont painting a bust while skydiving. Yeah, I, I have heard of that. Uh, but I have not watched it. I am terrified by skydiving, so. I agree with you. Yeah, mathophile, yeah. Yeah, we, David and I try very hard to avoid being salty at Overwatch. I mean, I find that there are fewer trolls these days, a little bit, but. Uh, I don't know, we, we're salty verbally quite often, just not, you know, when other people can hear it. Yeah, we, we tend try, to stay in our own group. We try not to, like, say things in chat that are just going to make things worse. Right, yeah, because we understand oh, that. Yeah. Yeah, we understand that getting salty, you know, really in chat has no purpose because it's just going to make everybody feel bad. So you never want to do that. Um, but yeah, we do get a little salty between ourselves yeah, when we we're on a really bad team. Our teammates to each other. We <laughs> catch up the other game. <laughs> and they're probably complaining about us too. So we're all good. <laughs> see here do 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 alrighty just trying to get like some of this brown all all factored in so that tomorrow we can do the mouth rawr and we, we of course when we paint the mouth we have to do lots of rawring I do like um, the color that this uh, NMM gold highlight is making uh, for the highlight on this wood, though. I think it kind of like feels like candlelight to me. I like it a lot. I'll probably do it again on something else. Doo -doo -doo. Yeah, I mean, uh, the other way to use the wet palette that I'm not doing because I'm doing so much wet blending because I'm trying to move so fast is uh, is to use it to make mixes of paint, you know, so that I, if I wanted to, I could mix up my transition color between the shield brown and the NMM gold instead of mixing every brushful as I have been doing on my brush. Um, I could make the you know a new puddle of paint. This is what the wet palette excels for. If you're trying to paint in stages, is that you can then make a small puddle. And this small puddle, even though it's very little, and normally on a, on a dry surface like a regular uh, well palette, it would dry in instantly. But on the wet palette, it stays wet. So you have this little mix. This little puddle of mix, if you just need it for a little while, you have it and you can play with it, right? So that's the uh, other way that the wet palette excels. So now I can reach again for that, that color and uh, bring it in if I want it. Mostly, though, I just want a little bit. One of the other things that I like about, one of the things I actually like about the wet palette is something I just did, so I'm thinking about it. But I had smooshed those colors together, but they were rough. So I just came and took a lot of paint off my brush, and that also put water onto it. And then I used that wetter brush to blend this together. So you can also do that to like kind of take some of the paint off your brush and also to add a little water to it. You can always roll your brush across the surface of the wet palette that and you'll pick up some water, you'll dilute the paint on your brush, and so if you want to glaze or blend, you can do it. It's a, a nice kind of side effect of the wet palette. So like I said, palettes are, both palettes can be used for everything. They're just like, it's different styles. It's different tricks. Um, you know, try both. Figure out which one is more your speed or maybe you, you alternate between them depending on the project. A lot of people will do a bit of that or the, uh, depending on the stage of the project. Um, I just find that I paint very differently 
when I am using a wet palette than when I am using a well palette. And perhaps it's that usually when I reach for the well palette, I am specifically trying to paint differently. I am specifically trying to push myself out of my comfort zone. So especially with regard as regards to like keeping things like dark or light or, you know, trying to make a dramatic shadows like here, I totally missed my dramatic shadow. Dramatic shadow. Got to put in our dramatic shadows. Got to got to get the mimic's chin outlined here. Rawr. So now I painted in some of that really dark walnut color. Kind of keeping in mind where my shadows would fall there. And that's very rough, but that's when now you can kind of mix a little bit of russet brown into your walnut and bring that in. And then maybe you mix a little bit of your shield brown with your russet and you can bring that in and blend it in. so that it gets softer and more blended. Yeah, Kariniko, exactly. It's not my normal style at all. So, but that's, that's why it's useful. It's useful to get yourself out of your comfort zone. Then when you, if you go back to your normal painting style, perhaps you can retain a little bit of the other style and keep it in mind. Now, this is very rough. One thing about this style is that it is, is very rough, right? And it's, and it is a high drama. You can see, I hope the shadow is, you know, falling on the model by where I'm putting the, uh, the shades and highlights. So I could do this with layering, but I'd probably, it would take me a lot longer. Um, and I might not have reached quite so dark shadows cause I would have been, um, unless I started extremely dark, I, I might not go that far. I find that I don't push my shadows as much when I'm using the layering. And, you know, Zenith, doing the Zenith priming helps some people with that. That's why some people do the Zenith priming is because then the black can make a, it can remind them that they want a very dark shadow. Um, so that, and I find that that helps me also. I have had this problem with contrast, by the way, since I was a, a kid working in pencils, where I was always a little bit afraid to go very dark with my contrast. So that's why I decided today that I wanted to push and use this wet palette and uh, work on that, right? I am somebody, I mean, I know a lot of people just don't like competitions and they don't like the whole spirit of that thing, but I am definitely somebody who feels like gets a lot, uh, gets rewarded by getting better, like trying to get better, trying to produce. I'm most rewarded when I look at a piece that I made and I really enjoy it, like just viscerally because I, I like the lighting or I like the freehand, right? I think it's just beautiful, right? And being able to create something that makes me happy like that is a big motivator for me, which is why I'm always trying to push my boundaries um, and trying to get better because then I'm almost as surprised as anybody when I paint something and it turns out really well and I get really happy and pleased because I just wasn't necessarily expecting it. I was hoping for it. So I guess that's some of my mindset when I'm painting. Um, and the reason why I do things like today, like push myself to use a medium or a, or a tool that I'm not in my mind, sometimes I just think I'm just not good with that. Right. You can get trapped thinking that it's not true at all. It's not that I'm not good at it. It's just that it's not, I haven't practiced as much with it. And so I haven't learned all of its tricks yet. So the more I push myself to play with something and push my, see what the tricks are, see, see what uh, tricks I like, you know, about it. Um, better. There, so now we've got a little bit more highlights coming out on this little guy. And I well, did lose a little bit of shadow, so I'm going to grab some walnut and some russet brown and reintroduce this shadow because I missed it. Totally lost it. Rawr. Rawr. He's got a lot of drama, though. You can see the shadows and everything. Uh, you know, Matthew, I think it's both. Because I paint in sections... So if I finish off a section and I really like this section that I finished, I get enjoyment from that. It's actually why I paint in pieces like that. It's because I need to make progress. I need to be able to look at a piece of the model and be able to kind of envision what the rest of it's going to be like when it's done. And if I'm really pleased with part of the model, that really keeps me going because I'm like, oh, now the rest of it's got to be this good. Um, so yeah, both, both. 
I almost think the process may be a little bit more though, because once I'm done with the model, I do enjoy looking at it, but I just tend to set it aside. It's done its thing, right? Now it's time to think about it the next one. Ah, uh, you have the penguin attack pack for first minis to paint. Hi, hey, strange. Where can I find pictures of painted minis? Um, actually, if you go to the Reaper store and you look up the model number, if the, if we have any painted examples, it will actually be in the store. You should look at the, there are usually thumbnails under it. And if there is a painted version, then it will be on there, I believe. It'll be next to like the pictures of the mo the black and white model. Let's see here. What do I need? I need more shadow over here. So, or, I mean, if you're painting penguins, I think probably the thing to do is to just look at penguins, um, since they tend to be very simple as far as their colors go. I always look at the, when painting an animal, I always use as reference, um, pictures of the actual animal. Cause you'll always like, you won't necessarily get your patterns right. And if you don't get the color pattern right, then it doesn't look quite right. I would what say the unicorn. Huh? So what if it's a, a unicorn? Well, then are you going to paint it like a normal horse? Because if you're going to paint it a traditional horse color, then yes, I would use horse reference photos. Okay, so for fantasy animals, you use reference photos of the animal that it's based upon, I right? Yes, correct. And maybe not if the unicorn is going to be pink, but even then, if I, if I go to a look at a white horse or a light gray horse, um, then I can see where the highlights and shadows should go, where the muscles are. And that informs the process. So yeah, same thing. Even if it's a really not standard color. So if you were doing your dire penguins in pink and white instead of black and white, you would still want to reference real penguins because you'd want to see where those areas of pink should be. All right. All right. I think we're pretty, um, we're looking pretty good here. I haven't like highlighted and shaded up around his eyeballs as much as I would like, but... We had fun. We talked about wet palettes a lot and well palettes. And actually, you guys can see, though, that I got a lot more drama on this model. A lot more extreme darks and lights and uh, a very different style than I normally do, which perhaps shows you how much you can switch up your style by changing a significant tool like a palette or a brush. And by brush, more um, brush size. You know, like I'm painting with a much larger brush than I usually do. So it can make you concentrate. Switching to a different size of brush and a different consistency of paint can make you concentrate on different things on the model. So if you find that you use tiny brushes and you're a really slow painter, um, try switching to a big brush and moving fast on a big model like this where it can be fun. Oh yeah, a dire, the dire penguin, right, Strange? Yeah. Uh, we have some for in like chronoscope I think, Mathophile. I think we have some Native American stuff, but I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Yep. All right. That's cool. Yep, yep, yep. All right. I have caught up on questions. Uh, Justin, do we have a raid? We will in just one second. All right. Well, then I'm going to define some light. Now, uh, on the top of the head, guys, remember it's all lighter. Uh, because the light is shining directly down onto it. So the shadows are not going to be as dark. And I need to bring up the highlights lighter. Oh, I got a raid. You got a raid? Who are we going to raid? Mocha. Oh, Mocha. Awesome. Fantastic. We haven't raided Mocha for a long time. You guys totally have to give Mocha our love, okay? Tell her I will miss seeing her at ReaperCon. Right, although I'll see her virtually, I'm sure. Alrighty, cool. Well, everybody, I hope you enjoyed today's show. I hope you enjoyed talking about stuff like, you know, different different palettes, pluses and minuses. And I hope that if you don't use a wet palette, you'll try it out. And I hope that if you don't use a well palette, you'll try it out. Um, and uh, we can we can all expand our boundaries. Alrighty, and I'll see you guys tomorrow. I think we'll do the mouth tomorrow. I want to kind of do it like uh, maybe the outside of the mouth is like the sheet, like blue, and then go back into pink on the inside. And we'll use a wet palette again, I think, just for fun. We'll do we'll do it fast because I want more drama again. I want this to be a very dramatic monster. He looks dramatic to me, plainly a prima donna. Alrighty, have fun, guys, and I'll talk to you later. Bye.
Awesome. Thanks, guys. Keep being awesome. And don't forget, at 3 o'clock today, Central Time, we have Miniature Monday with Josh. So make sure you guys tune in. Thank you.